People bestow favors on one another even when they are unrelated and have no sexual interest. It is easy to understand why even the most selfish organism might want to do so. If favors are traded, both parties profit. As long as the value of what they get is greater to them than the value of what they give up. A clear example is a commodity whose benefit shows diminishing returns. If I have two pounds of meat and no fruit, and you have two pounds of fruit, no meat, the second pound of meat is worth less to me than the first, since there's only so much meat I can eat at a sitting, and you feel the same way about your second pound of fruit. We're both better off if we exchange a pound for a pound. Economists call the benefit a gain in trade. When traders exchange goods simultaneously, cooperation is easy. If the other guy is uh, reneging, you hang on to your meat or grab it back. Most favors, however, cannot be retracted, such as sharing information, saving a drowning person, or helping in a fight. Also, most favors cannot change hands at the same time. Needs may change. If I help you now in return for protection of my unborn child, I cannot collect until the child is born and surpluses often are staggered. If you and I have just failed antelopes, there's no point in trading identical carcasses. Only if you failed one day and I fail one in a month does it make sense to trade. Money is one solution, but it is a recent invention and could not have figured in our evolution, of course, because before money was a bartering economy. And as we saw earlier, the problem with delayed exchanges or uh, reciprocation is that it's possible to cheat to accept a favor now and not return it later. Obviously, everyone would be better off if no one cheated. But as long as the other guy might cheat, which is inevitable when individuals can vary, I may be discouraged from extending him or her a favor that in the long run would help us both. The problem has been compressed into a parable called the prisoner's dilemma. Partners in crime are held in separate cells, and the prosecutor offers each one a deal. If you rat on your partner and he or she stays, you go free and he gets 10 years. If you both stay, uh, you both get six months. But if you both rat each other out, you both get five years. The partners cannot communicate, however, and neither knows what the other will do. Each one thinks, if my partner rats and I stay, I'll do 10 years. But if he rats and I rat too, I'll do five if he stays and I stay, I'll do six months. But if he stays and I rat, I'll go free. Regardless of what he does, then, I'm better off betraying him. Each is compelled to turn in his partner, and they both serve five years. Far worse than if each had trusted the other. But neither could take the chance because of the punishment he or she would incur if the other did not. Social psychologists, mathematicians, economists, moral philosophers, and ethics and nuclear strategists have fretted over the paradox for decades. Of course, it's not any difference in uh, deterioration in terms of nuclear arms. Real life, however, is not a prisoner's dilemma in one respect. The mythical prisoners are often placed in their dilemma once. Real people face each other in dilemmas of cooperation again and again, and can remember past treacheries or good turns in play accordingly. They can feel sympathetic and extend goodwill, feel aggrieved and seek revenge, feel grateful and return a favor, or feel remorseful and make amends. Recall that Trivers proposed that the emotions making up the moral sense could evolve when parties interacted repeatedly and could reward cooperation now with cooperation later and punish defection now with defection later. Robert Axelrod and William Hamilton confirmed the conjecture in a round-robin computer tournament that pitted different strategies for playing a repeated prisoner's dilemma game against each other. They stripped the dilemma to its essentials and awarded points to a strategy for the equivalent of minimizing jail time. A simple strategy called tit-for-tat. Cooperate on the first move and then do what your partner did on the move before beat 62 other strategies. Then they ran an artificial life simulation in which each strategy reproduced in proportion to its winnings, and a new round robin took place among the copies of the strategies. They repeated this process for many generations and found that the tit-for-tat strategy took over the population. Cooperativeness can evolve when the parties interact repeatedly and remember each other's behavior and reciprocate it. 
And as we have understood, people are good at detecting cheaters and are fitted with moralistic emotions that prompt them to punish the cheaters and reward the cooperators. Nobody likes a cheat, after all. So, does that mean that tit-for-tat underlies the widespread cooperation we find in the human species? Uh, it certainly underlies much of the cooperation we find in our society. Uh, cash register tapes, punch clocks, train tickets, receipts, accounting ledgers, and the other accounterments of transactions that do not rely on the honor system are mechanical cheater detectors. The cheaters, such as thieving employees, are sometimes charged with crimes. But more often, they are simply cut off from further reciprocation. That is, fired. I have been fired before. Similarly, the businesses that cheat their customers soon lose them. Footloose job applicants, fly-by-night businesses, and strangers calling with investment opportunities are often discriminated against because they look like they are playing a one-shot rather than a, I, I iterated uh, game of cooperation and so are immune to tit-for-tat. Even moderately good friends privately remember the most recent Christmas gifts and dinner party invitations and calculate the proper way to reciprocate. Does all this accounting come from our alienation and bourgeoisie values in a capitalist society? Uh, one of the fondest beliefs of many intellectuals is that there are cultures out there where everyone shares freely. Marx and Engels thought that pre-literate peoples represented a first stage in the evolution of civilization called primitive communism, whose maxim was, quote, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, end quote. Indeed, people in foraging societies do share food and risk, but in many of them, people interact mainly with their kin. So the biologists sense they are sharing with extensions of themselves. Many cultures have also have an ideal of sharing, but that means little. Of course, I will proclaim how great it is for you to share. Uh, the question is, will I share when my turn comes? Uh, and uh, so that's the key right there. Uh, we're going to talk later about kith and kin. Uh, there'll be two parts to that section. We'll talk about parents and children. That'll be a two-part series. Husband and wives will be three-part series. We'll wait for that later. Uh, we'll talk about allies and enemies. That'll be a one-part video. Uh, this is a one-part video, and then music will also be a one-part video, and the inquisitive in pursuit of the inconceivable will be a two-part uh, series as well. I will also cover uh, parents and children as well. Anyways, so foraging peoples, to be sure, really do share with non-relatives, but not out of indiscriminate lar largesse or a commitment to socialist principles. Uh, the data from anthropology shows that the sharing is driven by cost-benefit analyses and a careful mental ledger for reciprocation. People share when it would be suicidal not to. In general, species are driven to share when the variance of success in gathering food is high. Say, in some weeks I am lucky and I have more food than I can eat, but in other weeks I am very unlucky and in danger of starving to death. But how can I store extra food in the fat weeks and draw on it in the lean weeks? Refrigeration is not an option. I could gorge on it now and store it as a blubber, but that works only up to a point. I can't eat enough in a day to avoid hunger for a month, but I can store it in the bodies and minds of other people. In the form of a memory of my generosity, they feel obliged to repay me when fortunes reverse. When the prospects are risky, it pays to pull the risks. The theory has been confirmed in non-human species, such as vampire bats, and it has also been confirmed in humans in two elegant studies that control for differences among cultures by contrasting the forms of sharing within a culture. Uh, for example, there, the Ake of Paraguay hunt game and gather plant foods. Hunting is largely a matter of luck. On any given day, a hunter has a 40% chance of coming home empty-handed. Gathering is a large matter of effort. The longer you work, the more you bring home, and an empty-handed gatherer is probably lazy rather than unlucky. And as predicted, uh, those kinds of people share plant foods only within the nuclear family, but then they share the meat throughout the band. Uh, we have band societies before we had tribal societies. The Kung San of the Kalahari Desert are perhaps the closest thing that the world has to primitive communists today. Sharing is holy, boasting and hoarding are contemptible. Uh, they hunt and gather in a harsh, drought-prone ecosystem, trade food and access to water holes. The uh, Ghana San, a neighboring branch of the same people, have taken to cultivating melons which store water and to herding goats. They do not yo-yo between good times and bad as much as their cousins, 
and unlike them, they hoard food and have developed inequalities in wealth and status. In both the Ake and the San, high-variance foods are shared, low-variance foods are hoarded. These people do not pull out calculators and compute the variances, what goes through their minds when they decide to share. Cosmides and Tubi note that the psychology is hardly exotic. It matches our own sense of fairness and compassion. Consider what makes people more or less willing to help the homeless. Uh, those who urge that we all share with the homeless emphasize the random variance-driven dimension to homelessness. Homeless people are worthy of aid because they are down on their luck. They are the unfortunate victims of circumstances like unemployment, discrimination, or mental illnesses. Now, advocates of the homeless urge us to think, there but for fortune I go. Those who oppose sharing, on the other hand, emphasize the predictability of rewards in our society to anyone willing to put in the work. Homeless people are unworthy of aid because they are able-bodied but lazy, or brought it on themselves by choosing to drink or to take drugs, for example. Uh, they could just have a mental illness. Uh, but defenders of the homeless reply that drug use is itself an illness that could happen to anyone. But even at their most munificent, foraging people do not act out of hearts filled with loving kindness. They enforce the sharing ethic with obsessively detailed memories of who has helped, who has helped not, who has not helped, a clear expectation of payback, and snide gossip about those who don't pitch in. And uh, of course, uh, and all this still does not expunge selfish feelings, of course. Uh, the anthropologist Melvin Connor, who lived with the Kung San for years, has written respectively about their ways. He tells his readers, quote, selfishness, arrogance, avarice, cupidity, fury, covetousness, all these forms of gluttony are held in check in their traditional situation in the same way simple alimentary gluttony is. Namely, it doesn't happen because the situation does not allow it, nor is some supposed because the people or their culture are somehow better. I never ever forget the time a Kung man, the father of a family about 40 years of age, well respected in the community, a good and substantial man in every way, asked me to hold on to a leg of antelope that he had killed. He had given away most of it, as one had to, but he saw a chance to hide some of it for later for himself and for his family. Uh, perhaps that was greedy. Uh, of course, many primates uh, would think so and probably would have killed him for it. But ordinarily, of course, there would be no place in the entire Kalahari to hide it. It would either be unsafe from scavengers or unsafe from predatory distant relatives. But the presence of foreigners presented an interface with another world, and he wanted to slip the meat temporarily through a chink in that interface into the only conceivable hiding place. End quote. When it comes to friendship, reciprocal altruism does not ring true. It would be unquestionable taste for a dinner guest to pull out his wallet and offer to pay the host for his dinner. Inviting the host back the very night would not be much better. Tit for tat does not cement a friendship. It strains it. Nothing can be more awkward for good friends than a business transaction between them, like the sale of a car. The same is true for one's best friend in life, a spouse, for example. The, and we'll talk about wives and husbands and also do our second part series on men and women. Uh, but anyway, uh, the couples who keep close track of what each other has done for the other are couples who are the least happy. Uh, compassionate love, the emotion behind close friendship and the enduring bond of marriage or the love that is neither romantic nor sexual has a psychology of its own as well. Friends or spouses feel as if they are in each other's debt. But the debts are not measured and the obligation to repay is not erroneous, but deeply satisfying, obviously, because it's a, uh, you're not holding a double standard. Uh, but people feel a spontaneous pleasure in helping a friend or a spouse and giving pleasure uh, to get pleasure or pleasure for the sake of pleasure without anticipating repayment or regretting the favor if repayment never comes. Of course, the favors may be tabulated somewhere in the mind and the recesses of the unconscious, and if the ledger has become too lopsided, a person might call in the debt or cut off future credit. That is in the friendship, of course, but the line of credit is long in terms of repayment for giving. A compassionate love then does not literally contradict the theory of reciprocal altruism, but it does embody an elastic version in which the emotional guarantors Liking, sympathy, gratitude, and trust are stretched to the limit. The facts of compassionate love are clear enough, but why did it evolve? 
Tubi and Cosmides have tried to reverse engineer the psychology of friendship by calling attention to an aspect of the logic of exchange they call the banker's paradox. So we just talked about the prisoner's dilemma. Now we're talking about the banker's paradox. Many frustrated borrowers have learned that a bank will lend you exactly as much money as you can prove you don't need. Uh, as Robert Frost put it, quote, a bank is a place where they lend you an umbrella in fair weather and ask for it back when it begins to rain, end quote. The banks say that they have only so much money to invest and every loan is a gamble. Of course, I have a loan on my car right now. I'm trying to get a loan for my PhD. Will they give it to me? Probably not. But their portfolio who has to return a profit or they would go out of business. So they measure credit risks and weed out the worst. The same cruel logic applies to altruism among our ancestors. A person mulling over whether to extend a large favor is like a bank. He or she must not worry only about cheaters. It is beneficiary willing to pay. Are they willing to repay? Uh, but uh, about bad credit risks, is the beneficiary able to repay? If the recipient dies, is disabled, becomes a pariah, or leaves the group, the favor would have been wasted. Unfortunately, it is the bad credit risks, the sick, starving, injured, and ostracized who must, who most need favors. Of course, anyone will suffer a reversal of fortune, of course, especially in a harsh life of a forager. And once abandoned, the stricken forager is not long uh, for that world. Uh, what kinds of thoughts and feelings might evolve as a kind of insurance in which other people would extend credit to you, even if misfortune were to make you a risk. Uh, one strategy is to make yourself irreplaceable uh, by cultivating expertise that no one in the group can duplicate, uh, like tool making or wayfinding or conflict resolution. You, you make yourself costly to abandon in times of need. Everyone depends upon you. Too much to risk letting you die. Uh, people today, so you really you want to have the status quo, uh, status quo. Uh, but people today do spend a lot of their social lives publicizing their unique and their valuable talents, selling for themselves, saying or looking for a, a click in which their talents would be unique and also valuable. Uh, the quest for status is in part a motive for making oneself irreplaceable. But another is to associate with people who benefit from the things that benefit you. So merely by going about your life and pursuing your own interests, you can advance someone else's interests as a side effect. Marriage, for example, is the clearest example I can think of. The husband and wife share an interest in their children's welfare. Another was pointed out by Mao Tse Sung in his Little Red Book. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, he said. A third is to possess skills that benefit others at the same time that they benefit you, like being good at finding your way home. Other examples are living with a person who likes the room at the same temperature or who likes the same music taste as you. Uh, we're talking about sentiments here, similar sentiments that make people... Uh, uh, invest in each other. Uh, in all the examples, one delivers a benefit to someone without being altruistic in the biologist's sense of incurring a costly and thereby uh, needing a repayment to make the act worthwhile. Uh, the challenge of altruism has attracted so much attention in, in, uh, in recent years that a more direct form of helping in nature has often been downplayed. Symbiosis, in which two organisms, all right, think of the algae and the fungi making up uh, uh, a, a symbiotic relationship with each other, associate uh, because the side effects of each one's lifestyle fortuitously benefit one another. Uh, symbionts uh, give benefit and take them. Uh, neither pays a cost, however. Roommates with the same taste in music, for example, are a kind of symbiotic pair. Each can value the other without an exchange of favors. But once you have made yourself valuable to another person, the person becomes valuable to you. You value him or her because you were if you were ever in trouble, they would have a stake, albeit a selfish stake, in getting you out. But now that you have value in that person, they should value you even more. Not only are you valuable because of your talents or habits, but you are valuable because of your stake in rescuing him or her from hard times. The more you value the person, the more the person values you, and so on. It's so like it was said into a president who once said, why don't people like me? And they said the response, Sir, you're not a likable person, so there's the thing I teach the kids at school. If you're kind to someone, they're more than likely to be kind to you. But this runaway process is what we call friendship. And if you ask people why they are friends, they are likely to say we like the same things. We, like the, we have the same sentiments, and we know we'll always be there for each other. 
Of course, friendship is like other kinds of altruism. It is vulnerable to cheaters, and we have a special name for them, fair-weather friends. Uh, these sham friends reap the benefits of associating with a valuable person and mimic signs of warmth in an effort to become valued themselves. We call this manipulation. But when a little rain falls, they are nowhere in sight. They're gone, nowhere to be seen. People have an emotional response that seems designed to weed out fair-weather friends. When we are in the most uh, neediest of times, an extended hand is deeply affecting. We are moved to never forget the generosity and feel compelled to tell the friend we will never forget it. Hard times show you who your real friends are, and that is because the point of friendship in evolutionary terms is to save you in hard times when it's not worth anyone else's trouble. Both Tubi and Cosmides go on to speculate that the design of our friendship emotions may explain the alienation and loneliness that so many people feel in a modern society. Explicit exchanges and turn-taking reciprocation are the kinds of altruism we fall back on when friendship is absent and trust is low. But in modern market economies, we trade favors with strangers at unprecedented rates. It may create the perception that we are not deeply engaged with our fellows and are vulnerable to desertion in difficult times by our fellow brothers and sisters. And ironically, the comfortable environment that makes us physically more secure may make us emotionally less secure because it minimizes the crises that tell us who our real friends are.